so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I think we should start now. And uh, I think it's good to see so many of you, at least with all the multiple competing activities happening at the university today. And uh, yeah, so I think it's, it's my absolute pleasure to uh, introduce our uh, colloquium speaker for the day, uh, Dr. Manoj Kumar. He is not really a stranger to the university because he was here uh, in early March, where some of you, I think, were part of the uh, mental health roundtable and he presented in the panel on uh, looking at uh, uh, community interventions uh, and looking at interventions in the space of mental health uh, in general. And uh, yeah, so while talking about him, I think what's, what stands out is that he is an alumni of a uh, number of institutions which are in very formalized psychiatric settings and he is himself a trained psychiatrist and who believes that there is a role that psychiatry plays in uh, the context of uh, mental health and that cannot be wished away. And uh, after finishing his uh, uh, MD in psychiatry, he's uh, done a lot of work in the area of uh, working with, uh, pe with people, HIV, psychiatric issues of people with HIV AIDS and also uh, psychological support and uh, working on issues of pain with uh, people from, uh, people suffering with uh, cancer. And uh, a lot of the work has happened in, uh, also in the UK where he, uh, he, he was based for nearly 10 years. And, uh, as a teacher, as a researcher, as a practitioner, as uh, someone who uh, believes in, in bringing together uh, all, all, all the knowledge and multiple approaches towards, in some ways, addressing the human condition. And I think that has been at the core of his uh, work. And I'll just read out a little bit about, uh, in, as a part of uh, the work that he's been doing. So I'm not going to talk about the Mental Health Action Trust. He will introduce uh, the organization and the work that the Mental Health Action Trust does. Uh, the citation to an award uh, that he just received uh, from the Royal College of Psychiatrists reads uh, that Dr. Kumar's entry is an excellent example of selfless leadership, clarity of objectives, and patient centricity. It is exhilarating and exciting to read and to share his vision. His pioneering model of mental health care is inspirational, innovative, and sustainable. So I think we're really fortunate to have him with us to speak to us about this model that uh, they've talked about in this. Thank you. Thank you for the kind introduction and uh, this honor of speaking at this colloquium. It's great to be back here. Um, and I guess I, I understand that you've had a series of events in connection with uh, Mental Health Awareness Week, and today is probably the, the last day of that. The World Mental Health Day comes around in the next two, three days. So in, in that sense, it gives those of us in the profession an opportunity to try to engage uh, with the wider society on issues uh, which are hugely neglected and of relevance to, to all of us. So it's a great privilege to be here, to be with all of you. Um, I'm quite happy to take questions as we go along. Uh, normally, you, we have the question and answers at the end. But if you so wish, just raise your hands, and I'm more than happy to take questions as we go along. Because, you know, it's, it's not a very narrow to topic or narrow way of looking at it that I have chosen. I'll start from kind of very broad issues in community mental health or mental health, and then narrow it down. A lot of the issues that may be of uh, relevance to you, when I say you, I mean students, people who are, um, you know, middle class and above, professionals. Uh, for, for many of you, the issues may not be se severe mental disorders mm, or serious mental illnesses, but mental health issues in broadly. Because mental health covers everything from, you know, coping with the myriad problems that face us on a day-to-day -day base, basis to the end of, uh, to the other extreme of severe mental illnesses. Currently, in, in this phase of my career, it's the other end that I'm focusing on, which are people with, extremely poor people with severe mental illnesses. And the work I do is 
around that. Hmm? But for you, what may be relevant may be the, the other end of the spectrum, the, the milder conditions. In other words, positive mental health onwards. You know, how do we stay mentally healthy and so on. So I'm happy to take questions on any aspect. Hmm? But I'll kind of come from the background of providing a service in an innovative model to thousands of people extremely poor and struggling with all implications of severe mental illnesses. So that, that's my kind of background. Mm -hmm. But I'm happy to steer the discussion in any direction that you wish and at any point in time. Just put up your hand and we'll... Because I think the, the audience is small enough to allow us to interact. Mm -hmm. And so you've chosen to come here, so you might as well make the most of it by, by engaging in a dialogue. Yeah, so as I said, the World Mental Health Day is uh, kind of comes around every year. I'm not quite sure how relevant or useful these days are, but uh, here we are again. Uh, it's been going on for a number of years. Um, and this year's theme is quite a different theme from before. I think they are running out of themes. So this time, the theme is psychological first aid, which I'm not really going to talk about in my presentation. Because here in India, where it's estimated that more than 90% of people with even severe illnesses, hmm, so to use a, a wrong term, madness, hmm, more than 90% of people with madness are not getting any treatment or any kind of care. Hmm. It seems kind of irrelevant to us to talk in terms of psychological first aid, which is all about what you might do as peer counselors or what you might do as a lay people uh, in when you come across psychological or emotional trauma. So we are nowhere at the stage of having that as a priority because we are still struggling with n people, millions of people not having access to any kind of mental health care. So the aim is to really, towards the end, to discuss the feasibility and sustainability of different models of mental health care. Hmm? Because we only have two models in health care. We have the ever-shrinking public health model. Hmm? I don't think any of you would have accessed a government medical facility ever, or even at least recently. Partly because you're all young and healthy, but partly also because it just doesn't occur to us to use the free government facilities because of obvious issues. Hmm? Am I right? Or are there exceptions? Hmm? So overall, as a society, we have allowed our medical care to be commercialized, to be privatized, so that we expect to pay for our health care. Hmm? We've almost forgotten that it is our right to have basic health care free of cost. The state should provide that. When I was young, we used to believe in that, but um, nowadays nobody ever seems to think about it or talk about it, and sometimes some, some people do as if it's a new idea. Hey, why not have free health care for everyone? You know, because that was, that was how it was envisaged, but somewhere we have lost track. So there is the ever-shrinking public system of uh, hospitals and primary health centers and ever-increasing uh, privatized medical systems uh, so that we are sp we, all of us are spending more and more money on our health care. Now, it's fine if we are well enough to do that or if we have insurance to cover that, that's well and good. Again, the fact that you are paying for, for a service does not mean that you, you will get the best quality of service. So quality is something which we don't talk about at all because we are still trying to be self-sufficient in the services we have. So when it comes to mental health care, for especially for poor people, they have very little choices. They have the skeletal public health system, hmm, which in a big city like uh, Bangalore would amount to, say, Nimhans and a few government hospitals. And the rest of the state of uh, Karnataka or the country of India, there would be primary health care centers. Most of them would not have any uh, any input into mental health care. Hmm. The government does have a, 
uh, district mental health program, which is patchy. Uh, a, a number of districts have some form of skeletal mental health care. So your real option is to approach the private sector. And because mental illnesses, most of the mental illnesses are chronic and uh, follow a chronic course and have a, you know, a run, a remitting and relapsing course, what it means is that the first few times people may spend out of pocket to access good quality or some sort of quality of mental health care. And after a while, they, they no longer, they are either impoverished in the process of finding care or they, you know, they, they, they dis dis discover that they can no longer afford mental health care. So we have millions of people who then drop out of mental health care altogether. And most of the severe mental illnesses after a few years reach a kind of a chronic stage where they are no longer violent or disruptive. So they, they become invisible. They just spend um, totally unproductive lives uh, inside houses or wandering the streets or so on. So this is far more common than you would expect. We have the experience of wherever we start a new clinic, we, we so far have about 47 centers. Each new place, often quite a small, remote by Kerala standards village, we start a clinic and then we are amazed at the number of people who turn up, who have been unwell for decades. Uh, who have been looked after by the communities, by the family, for decades with no expectation of, of getting better, because they've given up. And we also at that point start thinking, okay, 30, year, 30 years this person has been dysfunctional, can we do anything? And we find to our amazement that they, most of them recover significantly with a limited amount of care that we give. So the real issue is provision of continuous care. There's no other issue in mental health. It's lack of provision of good quality mental health care. Uh, that is the, the predominant problem all over the world. And our attempt is to provide a different model, not in the government sector, not in the private sector, but using volunteers generated from the community, resources generated from the community to provide good quality mental health care. The implications are obvious. If, if this model is feasible and sustainable, then it is a cost-effective way of plugging a big gap in the system. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the history of, of sorry, if you look at the history, I mean, I'll, we'll briefly go through history because even though we talk, we think in terms of history as a longitudinal process, very often in various contexts it's no longer logical. For example, the first major development in the history of mental health care was the realization that people with severe mental illnesses or madness are unwell or ill. That realization was a, was a huge important first step. Madness is an illness. And this happened in, the, in, the, in Europe, you know, around 250, 300 years ago, when people realized that madness is not due to supernatural causation, it's not due to possession by jinns or evil spirits or because the neighbor has done black magic. But these are people who are ill. Now, why is that realization so, so important? That realization is important in, in many ways because by then we, had, we were quite clear with the concept of illnesses and the privileges and responsibilities which came with people who were ill. So the idea was that any one of us as a, as a citizen in a society could fall ill and we had a right to be taken care of. So the rest of us had a right to look after, had a duty to look after the person with an illness. So we, get, we give people sick leave, we give them empathy, you know, we give them tender care, uh, we allow them not to work on the assumption that once they get well, they come back into the mainstream of society. So being ill carries a lot of privileges. You get sick leave, very basically, isn't it? It's, 
you get a right for treatment. So if you're not considered ill, you don't get any of those privileges. So up until then, it was thought that mental illness was due to supernatural causation, uh, and therefore people were locked away. And the first time that people realized that people need not be chained and locked and put away with uh, criminals, vagabonds, you know, all the outcasts from the society, and moved from that group to the people with illnesses. That was a seminal moment, 250, 300 years ago. What about us now? Does this still happen in, in the Indian context? Yes. We still are not sure whether mental illnesses or madness is an illness. Most of the country, irrespective of our educational status, will approach a traditional or religious person as a first line, even in Kerala. Because we no longer, and this still happens, we come across a lot of incidents of people being still chained up and locked up and, and so on. So problems begin at that level. Even though as mankind we have moved on from thinking of madness as an, uh, you know, as an affliction, we have that it is an illness, Ar around the world, people are still not fully convinced that this is an illness. So if it's not an illness, all the usual uh, things which go along with caring for illnesses will not happen. So what happened in Europe was that once they realized that um, people were ill, they still didn't have any clue as to how to help them, except be kind and humane to them. So large Victorian asylums were set up. And almost everything which happened in the West happened more or less at the same time in India, which is, of course, under colonial rule. So we developed similar institutions. Of those which have survived, there are 43 still left in India. And they are all now huge mental hospitals um, in, spread across parts of India. Um, uh, and they have transformed. In, in the West, all of these have been toned down and uh, care has moved into the community. But in India, we still have a system whereby large numbers of people are locked up. And you all know what happens when large people, large numbers of people are locked up. What, hap what, what happens? What horror stories have you heard of mental asylums? Mental asylums, they were meant to be places of refuge where people could be taken care of. Obviously, both in the West and here, the system was open to abuse. This is a, a, a famous uh, painting from um, a, a word uh, from a from a 17th, 18th century book. Hmm. The word bedlam, you familiar with the word, actually came from the name of this hospital, which is Royal Bethlehem Hospital. But these were the kind of this was, of course, dramatized version of what went on inside uh, all, all kinds of mad people locked up together. All of them are symbolic. You probably won't be able to, to read it, but uh, all kinds of mental illnesses are, are represented um, symbolically. The, the grandiose person who thinks he's a king, um, someone who's very melancholic sitting on the, um, on the stairs, and so on and so forth. And people actually paid money to go and there were visiting times and peep holes, so you paid whatever, one pence or whatever at that time, to see the madness, scenes of madness going on there. Of course, that was followed by, you know, an era where a lot of abuse happened. And towards the second half of last century, things changed because in keeping with developments in physics and chemistry and so on, effective treatments happened effective biological treatments happens. The first medicines came on the market. So what was still then an uh, incurable illness suddenly became curable. So large numbers of people began to get these chemicals and uh, quite a large proportion of those who received chemicals went on to become normal. That completely changed the things. Even before the drug era came in, post-Freud, the psychological era had started. So we now had two ways of helping people with mental illnesses or mental problems. A, a science of psychology as well as a science of pharmacology. 
that completely changed the picture. Um, so there was validation of the view that these are illnesses and therefore people need not be locked away in asylums which became abusive themselves or be held against their will because now a lot of people could be treated. <coughs> that led to the development of experiments with physical treatment. These are uh, kind of early uh, models of what is now uh, called electroconvulsive therapy or ECT. Um, and of course, medicines came along um, in the second half of last century. Mm. Psychological treatments by then were reasonably established and continued to evolve. So entirely, the, the scene changed. In the West, asylums closed down. We still continue to have a mixture of things. Uh, we know that we need to move into a community, uh, but the asylums and people being locked up continue. Uh, we know that it, it is an illness, but we are confused as to whether they are really illnesses or whether there is a supernatural element. And the downside of this development was that once medicines became available, it went on from being a, a brainless science to a mindless science because then everybody became a biological uh, scientist. So all psychiatrists, generations of psychiatrists, even now, get virtually no training in psychology. So the, so the psychiatrists practicing now, many of them would have had no training in, in anything psychological. So we have come to practice a very bio, biological model of psychiatry, even though we know that it should be psycho, biopsychosocial. In other words, we know that there should be equal attention paid to the psychological aspects of people's problems, to the social origins of mental illness, as well as what, what goes wrong in the brain. But unfortunately, what gets practiced is only the biological psychiatry. So you have a problem, you go to a, a, a psychiatrist and he writes a pill for you. Okay. Now, in, in a proportion of cases, that is all that is required, but it's only a small proportion. Most people would require both psychological as well as social ways of intervention in order to get better, which is why most people end up being dissatisfied with the psychiatry that is practiced. And often that turns into a, a kind of an anti-psychiatry movement uh, and f further alienating psychiatrists from, from other professions. So we are back to the original place where psychiatry is alienated. So what should be a, you know, our basic right to good mental health care still gets unfulfilled because of the biological models of psychiatry that we practice. <clears throat> so the, this is how it should be, biological, psychological and social factors intersecting to provide, to, to cause mental and behavioral disorders that we can do something about. So the isolation of psychiatric services continue also because they are cut off from grassroots or primary primary care level. If you want good mental health care, you go to a tertiary center in Bangalore, Nimhans. Your neighborhood physician or your neighborhood hospital will have no expertise in dealing with psychological or psychiatric problems because it's neglected in the medical curriculum as well. The few psychiatrists would practice biological psychiatry in tertiary or secondary settings. So there's virtually no primary care, pri at the primary level, mental health care uh, available. So even though most places in the world have shifted to a community-based care, whereby all these problems can be addressed. Hmm? If care is accessible in your neighborhood at the primary level, then you need not go to secondary or tertiary stigmatizing level, uh, stigmatizing uh, levels of care because it's still stigmatizing to to receive psychiatric treatment. Mm -hmm. so providers of treatment, psychiatrists are also stigmatized amongst our fellow medical colleagues because the, the, the public, everybody thinks that psychiatrists are a bit mad themselves. So there is levels of stigma at all 
at all levels. Hmm? So ideally, we know what a service should be, and that should be at the community level. So all over the world, this is what has happened. Asylums are closing down or have closed down. Uh, and the whole process is called deinstitutionalization. So people are no longer cared for in institutional settings, but in community-based settings. In parallel, at least in the West, there has been a growing awareness of patients or you know, people's rights. So the human rights movement has kind of uh, made psychiatrists and the mental health care system uh, take notice of patients' rights. Stigma as a, as a limiting factor in provision of good care is now well recognized. Uh, and the economic aspects of, of care are also well recognized. There are a lot of studies from India which show that uh, people at the borderline are pushed into poverty because of medical expenses. And that includes psychiatric expenses also. So the economic aspects of all, all of this, not just that, the number of man hours lost, the productivity lost, are all now well recognized. For the last 15, 16 years, we have known that it's mental health and neurological conditions, apart from cardiovascular disease, which causes most uh, damage to society. The rate of people dying who have mental illnesses are more than people who are healthy. But, so the mortality rate is high, or higher than common. But what is really high is the morbidity rate. And that is quite understandable. With any form of mental illness, the first thing to go is your productivity. If you are a student, you realize that you can no longer concentrate on your studies, you are not motivated to uh, attend class, you fall behind in your assignments and so on. If you are a employed person, you are unable to work, you lo lose your source of employment, and the society suffers. So cumulatively, mental illnesses are the number one causes of lost productivity in our society. And we have figures now to, to, to prove that. And that, in the last, that awareness in the last 15 years has forced uh, international agencies like uh, the UN and the WHO and national uh, governments to take note of this and to do something about it. <clears throat> and developments in treatment have, in general, aided that. So the real issue is, how do we provide good quality mental health care to large numbers of people close to where they live? And how big is the problem? What proportion of us have mental illnesses? Any guess? Hmm? Sorry? Uh, yeah, but, uh, sorry? See, the, see, this is the first response. I'm not having a go at you, but that response trivializes the problem. Hmm? We're not talking about, you know, the, the emotional ups and downs that each of us have. If we take that approach, the corollary of it is, if all of us get that, then there is no need for, no need to do anything. Because it then completely ignores the suffering, the huge suffering that people with higher levels of problems have. I've seen people who have suffered both physical illness and mental illness, and they all say they would rather go through the pain of cancer or pain of any other condition than the mental distress of, say, depression or something. Mm. So yes, we all have our bad days, but that, that is not what we are talking about. These are people amongst us, including myself, who have significant mental health issues, which at the very least can disrupt our functioning, or worse, make us completely dysfunctional. At least 2% of any population will have madness, severe mental illnesses. Again, I repeatedly use the word madness not in a pejorative sense, not in a stigmatizing sense, but to convey you know, a, a basic concept about losing our mind. So 1 to 2%, perhaps slightly more, 2 to 3% even, nobody really knows, of us have severe mental illnesses. 
these are illnesses which make you totally dysfunctional up to a quarter of us have uh, significant mental illnesses which again completely limits our capacities i'm not talking about exam stress or marital discord or things like that which are much more common these are you know those of us who are unlucky to have illnesses which significantly limit us one in four of us so it's a huge problem even if you say it's 2 to 3 percent with severe mental illnesses it's a huge problem 3 percent of the population and remember 90 percent of the people do not get adequate treatment so it's a big problem i'm sh quite sure many of us in this room have either friends or family members or know someone who has a severe mental illness and probably long term it's there in my family it's there in my friends so the problem is really big and there are various kinds of ways of quantifying the magnitude in terms of loss to the economy in in the us terms you know millions of dollars um you know man hours lost to industries suicides alcohol dependence so many facets are there so the, the the we know enough that magnitude of the problem is huge but still we why do we do nothing except talk about it on mental health days Oh, 90 per 90 percent of that goes unmanaged. reason why I also made it a point to attend the talk. Yes. See, the first thing with what you are pointing out as uh, mental illness is first acceptance, isn't it? That's one of the biggest hurdles. And here I'm also talking about families with a known history of yeah. uh, mental illness. Yeah. So if you're asking why we don't do anything about it, first seems to be the acceptance by the patient himself or herself. The second thing that I wanted to uh, bring up is I know of a friend uh, for over 25, 26 years now who is very seriously ill, bipolar and schizophrenia and to top it all the issue is also that she is a doctor, an excellent doctor but the fact is that she is ill. Uh, one of the things about law that I came to know recently is uh, we were very seriously contemplating uh, institutionalizing her. She is a green card holder. Right now she is somewhere in India at a high risk. By high risk I mean she travels, just goes off alone here and there uh, into places which are not, uh, you know, safe. But she refuses to and the law also complicates it because you need the patient's consent to be institutionalized. So here you are talking about a very curious case of a seriously mentally ill patient needs, she is a doctor and needs serious care but then you need her consent to, so I find it very curious. Yeah, there are several points there. Um, actually, the law allows us to treat her without her consent. Hmm. However, the that alternative route is very unpleasant police have powers to detain someone 
if they think there are reasonable grounds that a person is mentally ill hmm? and take them to a place of safety which is usually a police station produce them before a magistrate and the law gives the magistrate to commit such a person to an institution hmm? as I was, I was saying before you came about the, the Victorian style institutions we have and the kind of abuses which happen there still unfortunately the Human Rights Commission and others have brought out reports detailing the abuses within our system. So she can be forced to accept treatment, but that treatment would be very, very unsatisfactory. Hmm? To come back to where you started off as, you know, people not accepting their mental illnesses, part of the, pro or rather, we, I have come to believe over the last several years that a lot of stigma and people's refusal to accept this as an illness is partly cultural and social factors, but also hugely due to lack of availability of good care. So if I tell you on World Mental Health Day that mental health, mental illness is curable, you will be immediately thinking of lots of people that you know who have access to treatment have not got better. So you will not believe me. Wherever I have worked, what we have found that what destroys stigma is provision of good mental health care. Once people get better, then everybody accepts it as an illness. It happened in a, in a tribal, in a rural place in, in Wayanad where we work, where very early on um, a, a person who, a woman, a local woman, a tribal woman who had been unwell for many years. Everybody in the town knew her because she was the local mad woman. Somehow we happened to, somebody happened to bring her and she got completely normal. And in a small place that was noticed. So we had a steady stream of then severely mentally ill people being brought to us because people thought, oh, if she could get better, why not this person? Hmm. It has happened in HIV and AIDS. Most of you were born after the onset of uh, the pandemic. But those of us who were there at that time, before the medications came along, it was hugely stigmatized. Not just because it was sexually transmitted in our case, but because there was lack of cure. People just died. Now the stigma of HIV is completely reduced. As someone who was involved in the early days of the pandemic and now, it's the situation has completely changed. HIV has become another chronic infection, like tuberculosis, leprosy, and so on, all of which have, again, lost their stigma significantly. In the, in the old, olden days, if someone had a history of tuberculosis, they would not be able to find a groom or a bride. They would not be able to get married, let alone leprosy. You hardly see any leprosy patients now, because they have all become treatable conditions. The problem in psychiatry is that these age-old superstitions and stigma have persisted, partly because, like you said, the, the severely mentally ill person, himself or herself, will not have insight. But as a society, we do not see it as illness, even though the law allows us to treat somebody against their consent. Those mechanisms are not used because nobody is convinced that this is treatable. We treat exactly the same kind of people in the community without their consent. I know I am being recorded and I should not be saying this, but families bring people to us and somebody who's not consenting for treatment and says, do something. Now, if I say, no, you go by the law, you go to the police station, which is stigmatizing, people landing up on your doorstep with a police van is stigmatizing, being carted away to court is stigmatizing and doing an ending up in the government mental hospital is even more stigmatizing. Do I do that or do I go with the family's wish and treat somebody without consent, which is the lesser of the evils? Hmm? With treatment against their consent, which would happen, you know, through a legal mechanism in a hospital, they'll be held down and injected against their will. Often it is much more humane for the family to hold them down. And because it is the family, after the person recovers, there's no ill feeling. 
neither towards us nor towards the family members because people after they recover realize yeah i was not well and what they did was right very rarely do we get complaints mm, that you treated me against my will i'm going to sue you that may happen mm, but which which is the worse alternative cutting short somebody's illness against their consent but with the upon the family's request and the society's uh, consent an excellent doctor but when she gets into those periods of yeah. you know she is so you are saying that she can turn around and sue you uh, well if that that is because i try to provide poor quality care uh, if i treated her humanely with care and compassion still treated her against her will established a good relationship with her and as she recovered explained to her what had happened made her understand what she has gone through she will turn around and say thank you hmm? i realize how unwell i was i realize the, the the dangers that i had exposed myself to and thank you for doing this hmm? however our system does not do it in a humane fashion hmm? um and does not do the explaining bit does not do the caring bit but just gives the injection bit so a lot of stigma i would submit a lot of the issues are because we are unable to provide the ideal kind of care so we are we our, our discourses in this country still revolve around you know can we make the government system better can nimhans be expanded can there be more nimhanses across the country's you know top down programs mm. and a small number of people get left behind in these large hospitals mm. probably up to a quarter of the long stay beds in all these 43 government institutions including nimhans are occupied by people who are never going to go home they are abandoned by their families and so on so a lot of the debate in mental health circles is about how to rehabilitate these people mm. or there are various ngos working with uh, prominent visible subgroups such as homeless people or homeless women mm. i'm not saying that those two groups are unimportant but they are a drop in the ocean the real issue is not the couple of um, i don't know maybe across the country maybe 10000 people are languishing in um, uh, hospitals where they don't need to be mm. but millions of people are not getting any care so whatever resources we have are going into uh, these kind of groups so large numbers of nameless faceless people with severe mental illnesses there's no provision of care mm. we know that the treatment gap is huge treatment gap is the number of people who have a condition and the percentage who uh, get some form of care the difference between them is considered the treatment gap we know it is huge uh, it is huge every conference i go to the the usual discussions are around increasing funding increasing resources in last 30 years we have talked about this and there are never enough funds never enough people psychologists social workers psychiatrists to to manage people mm. we know what the what an ideal service should should be like we know it should be close to where we live you people living in bangalore are uh, lucky because you have all kinds of services within the city mm. the moment you st step out of bangalore into more and more interior karnataka you will realize that people have to travel long distances to access care we know that decentralized systems are are best you know large centralized structures of providing health care uh, have not worked anywhere in the world even successful models like the national health service in the uk are very decentralized we know if you go to uh, if you have a mental health problem you go to somebody you will get medicines you know that that's all you will get but really good care should be comprehensive it should be medicines plus psychological plus other forms of rehabilitation it should be free or at least affordable 
everyone should have ease of access, mm. um, which is always not possible. And there should be provision of rehabilitation because any mental health care without rehabilitation um, doesn't work. So what we have done over the last eight years is to try to develop a service close to the ideal. Uh, and that experiment has, the crux of it is that there's a third system, not governmental, not private, but people organizing themselves to look after people with illnesses in their own areas. That could be chronic illnesses, that could be people who are bedridden. We have a community palliative care movement in Kerala on the back of which we have developed this model. So essentially, it harnesses the powers of volunteers. We are a thickly populated state, Kerala. Overall, if you look at nation as a whole, we still have lots of people. A lot of people are happy to help. So we have lots, large numbers of volunteers, huge group of people who's, who want to do something meaningful, but there are no avenues. So what we have done is to tap into that huge pool of uh, people who are willing to help. From, the, from that pool, we train people uh, as non-professional health workers to more or less do what health workers would otherwise do, hmm? which means that the roles of professionals have to be redefined. I ask psychiatrist colleagues as to what proportion of people they see really need their level of expertise. And most friends say 10 to 15%. Not just psychiatrists, but other doctors also. So 70 to 80% of our time is spent seeing people who need not see a, psych see a specialist. Mm -hmm. So that's bad use of resources. So we need to redefine the roles of professionals so that the professionals are there to guide, supervise, support, and see complicated cases. The rest of the time should be spent in training people who sort of act up to do things which they're not really trained for, but can do under supervision, and in educational and training activities. So this is in, in, a, in crux what we are trying to do. So we have a network of independent clinics. Mm -hmm. Most of them are NGOs, some of them are in the government sector, primary health care centers. Because Kerala has a strong self -government, local self-government system, it is possible to work through the local self-governments and the local PHCs. Mm -hmm. Or we have the already established so-called palliative care centers, or groups of people we encourage to come together, give them training, to start off a center of their own. So it's completely owned by the community and led by volunteers, which of course means that it becomes affordable, cost-effective. In order to make it successful, people who run it have to own it, and that's easier said than done. But we actively promote decentralization and local ownership. None of the clinics will have our logo or M hat or anything. In meetings like this, I'll say it's an M hat center, but they are actually independent and they, they own. So we position ourselves as the professionals, as the experts coming in, helping them look after their own people. So that is the whole concept. And people are happy to do that, except they don't know how to. When people get into the mental health field, the first fear is, aren't they dangerous? Aren't mentally ill people dangerous? Hmm? Uh, without, you know, without knowing what to do, are we likely to encounter violence? Not at all. Mentally ill people are less dangerous than many other groups of people. Mm -hmm. So we gradually empower them to, to provide good care, continuously trained by us and supported by us. That is crucial. Mm -hmm. That provision of backup support. Because the government tries to do something similar by training uh, primary health center doctors and uh, other staff. But one-time training does not do anything. Unless there is a constant um, program of background support and training, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So we, we try to develop communities which are empowered and autonomous. Mm -hmm. 
And the roles of the volunteers could be direct or indirect. They could be in overall in charge of um, you know, organizing funding, infrastructure, finding the, the major financial component in all this is finding med money to pay for medicines. How expensive do you think are is psychiatric medication, medical care, medication? On an average, one person for a month or for a year, how much do you think will is required? Average. No idea. Still, hazard a guess. Thousands, hundreds, tens. Eh? No, that's. No, huh? no, it's. Huh. We find that on an average, it costs only about 400 rupees per month for a person. Hmm? That's 5,000 rupees a year. Hmm? Just imagine five to us spending 5,000 rupees on things. Hmm? And this is going to keep a person and a family, person well and therefore a family uh, well for a year. So in this day and age, when, uh, when if you have a fever and we go to a doctor and we buy anti antibiotics for five days of treatment, it'll be easily 300, 400 rupees or more, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Let alone the blood tests and, and so on. Mm -hmm. Just for five days of treating an infection which anyway does, may not have required medications. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about, you know, amounts as low as that for a year. 5,000 rupees a year to keep someone with a severe mental illness well enough and rehabilitated in the community. And that's just the medication cost. Hmm. The rest of it is all volunteers. Hmm. So more direct involvement will depend upon the motivation of the volunteers. So they could be, for example, running the outpatient centers. They could be doing home care, domiciliary care services when someone is not in a position to come to the hospital or they could be acting as individual care workers. In our model, every patient that we take, and we have more than 3,000 patients, every patient is um, allotted to a volunteer. And it's that volunteer's responsibility to be available every day and night, and at least once a week to check on how uh, the patient is. And it doesn't take much time, because they're all local people, and anyway, they, know, they may know this person. So it takes very li little effort to check on the well-being of a person who's under, under our care. And they could be checking on things such as, are they getting well or are they getting worse? Are they taking medications? Are there side effects from medications? Are there other medical problems? Are there other economic problems and so on? And if it is a medical psychiatric kind of problem, immediately they're on the phone to us uh, and we, through the phone, prevent crisis from developing. We encourage them to ring us day or night, and often that happens. Immediately as a problem arises, somebody in the neighborhood or family contacts the volunteer, they contact us, and we are able to sort it out before it becomes a crisis and requiring hospitalization. We realize that putting people into hospitals is totally unnecessary. You know, in a year, it's a very few people who need to go into hospital in, un under our system all of the rest of the problems can be managed with the cooperation of the family and the society represented by volunteers. Yeah. No, no. That we actively discourage because they are too, they, they'll, be, they'll be certainly biased. In order to provide good care, we need a bit of distance. So I, Hardly ever I'm successful if I try to treat my own family members because they have seen me and uh, it's different. A professional relationship is required, particularly for psychological interventions.
if you are born without a limb, you can have a prosthesis surgery that allows you to walk or whatever. And if you are born with an intellectual disability, which means your intelligence is subnormal, then you can be trained to overcome that to a certain extent, but there's no treatment for intellectual disability as in terms of increasing their intelligence. So people with severe intellectual disability, which I guess is what you're talking about, may in addition develop mental illnesses at some point in their lives, and those are curable, much like anyone else's mental illnesses. But the, the handicap which they were born with will remain and will need to be cared for. At severe levels, they have to be fed and bathed and so on. At less severe levels, they can be trained. There are special schools. There are institutions for intellectual disability where people are trained to, to cope better with, and families, to cope better with the condition. So it's, we're talking about two different groups. Uh, it's not possible for a person to be born with mental illness, you can be prone to it. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We are all prone to all disorders in the world. But our chances of developing an illness is higher if there is evidence that there is a genetic contribution. So far, except a few illnesses such as some forms of cancer is a way of testing or to be possible, testing we are tolerant. The best way of deciding on our vulnerability is to look at our family. Illnesses which run in families, we are at a higher risk of developing. So we are all born with vulnerabilities. Whether we will manifest that will depend upon A, the, amount, the, the, the level of vulnerability that we have inherited and B, the circumstances. So if I am uh, born with the vulnerability to develop depression, I may, de I may develop it at some point, uh, irrespective of the situation, depending on how much the vulnerability is. Or if the vulnerability is not that high, stress will cause me to break down. So that is a stress vulnerability model. That is, yeah. So are they trained? Yes. As also? Yes. Well, we don't use the word psychotherapist. We have various courses which train people in psychosocial interventions. So we don't expect them to spend years in a psychotherapist. Probably they are not Yeah. But we, in the model task share. An increasing number of people who started off without professional qualifications but who kind of work through the ranks. Uh, and finally, people who are able to do it, we, we share, we train them to provide psychosocial information. So I'll come back to that. That is possible, and that is the huge thing. Yeah. Because, paradoxically, we have far fewer psychologists. Or, you know, people who are trained in sector and in land doctors. The other country is probably the other you know, pure doctors. But as you say, it's vulnerable. I am born with the disease and all. So, for calling this killer, what's the initial symptom? So, we can actually. Yeah. See, there's. You know, there are so many disorders, as you know. And each disorder has a different uh, presentation. But, if you remember one thing you should be able to distinguish, which is a departure from previous level of function. Suppose you, you have a senior student, you, you have a close friend, and you notice a change in all that. This person was cheerful and you know, friendly, becomes more silent, snaps at you, and you notice that, you know, they even shabby in their appearance, they're falling behind in their grades, they're not sleeping well at night. Now all of this is affecting who they are. So that is the difference, that is the line where which is different between a problem and an illness. The 
basic definition of intelligence is a breakdown in our health, which affects our function. On the way here, I, was, I had a headache, I took a couple of tablets of passage on the way. That's a problem. It's not intelligence. Because I'm functioning this way. But if I have attacks of migraine, which means, you know, because I have a migraine, this morning I'm not able to be able to stop. There's a difference in that. So the rule of thumb changes in people's behavior, people's emotions, people's thinking, people's activities. It parts from the form. Significant enough, severe enough to affect much. That is how all the disorders are And then depending on the constitution of symptoms, we say that someone has schizophrenia or someone has depression or bipolar disorder or obsessive compulsive disorder and so on. But the starting point is experience of abnormal um, abnormalities. It may be in our thinking, it may be how we feel, we feel low all the time, nothing seems to cheer us up. You know, every day seems a, a chore. Uh, not just once in a blue moon, regularly. So there are duration criteria, severity criteria, but the basis is this. Changes in behavior. Changes in the way people act or think or behave. Mm -hmm. We always put it down to what is happening around them. Mm -hmm. But it's often something deeper. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we do train people in providing Is it subjective because a person might have a headache all through a week and yeah. still might function. The other person may not have a headache but he might feel low and out. So are there any, as per terminology goes, is there a threshold or is there a borderline or is it just subjective to, be, is, to classify this? Yeah. And secondly, yeah. uh, you said proneness and predilection to get a mental illness. Uh, the place where you come from, Kerala, has 30, you can correct me if my statistics are not exact or even wrong. 34 women out of 10,000 commit suicide. JNK, 2.2 out of 10,000 commit suicide. The national average is 7 or 8. Is there a geographical area proneness predilection? Is it has a study, I mean, this itself is a statistic. Or is it genetic? Is it lifestyle? Is it uh, this so-called education myth uh, versus literacy. So, is is there any uh, your comments on that? Yeah. I forgot the first. The first was uh, supposing uh, all this is subjective. Yeah, yeah. Okay. For a person might, uh, yeah. I think, uh, yeah. in a society, yeah. a certain level of activity might may be considered as normal. Yeah. In another. In that society, yeah. they might consider it to be low and out. And then the yeah. one with the problem may not manifest, the other without the problem. So, yeah. See, uh, it's, a, it's a combination of things. Like I said, the starting point of considering whether someone has an illness are changes significant enough to cause disturbance of function. In any aspect, maybe biological, we stop eating, we are not able to sleep, uh, or it may be functioning. We are not able to concentrate on studies or so, whatever. But changes in the way that we think, behave, act, feel. Which leads to changes in function. Okay, that's the starting point. Now, very often that is subjective. Often it may not be. For the more severe mental disorders like schizophrenia, the, the person who suffer, who has the problem may not really recognize it. But we will recognize it as his brother or sister or as his father. I'll recognize that my child is not right. Hmm? You see them smiling to themselves and you ask them, why are you smiling? I didn't smile. Hmm? And they drop out of school or whatever, changes happen. So it could be subjectively recognized or recognized by people around, but changes which affect functioning, that's the crucial bit. Again, every, no, there's nothing without a cultural or social context. So it's within what is considered abnormal in, in that social or communi community context. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 
vice versa, you have a tribal intelligence quotient test together and you apply it to people in the modern world, they might fail in that. So it's actually a question of laying down parameters and uh, thresholds. Yeah, this is why we don't define it along intellectual quotient at all. In fact, test for intellectual quotient are used universally. Because they try to be as culture free as possible. Hmm? That is why. But they are not actually. Sorry? But they are not. In fact, they are not. Well, you know, but we do not use that aspect at all. We have lots of tribal patients. No, I was just giving an example. I'm yeah, yeah. But it is the same criterion everywhere. Is it a departure significant enough to disrupt your, fun disrupt your life? Hmm? All, all of them disrupt. Uh, huh. That headache you had when you came here, yeah. that disrupted you at that point of time if someone were to ask you a very yeah. incisive question, your reply would have been rather dull and may not have answered it as well as you could have done if you yeah. didn't have the headache. Sure. So where do you decide yeah. that this is what my question is. Yeah. So where do you decide? Yeah. It there doesn't have to be a migraine yeah. for, uh, for uh, six months. Yeah. That itself is sure. made you a so little we, low. So we overcome that by having a duration criteria. So if the same pattern repeats over and over again, over a period of time, and in each disorder, we have consensus criteria of two weeks, six months, and so on, hmm? in order to overcome that issue. Hmm? So it's a mixture of duration, severity, social factors, contextual factors, which allows us to come to that uh, decision. In terms of the second question, suicide is a very complex phenomenon. Um, the mental health or mental illness angle to social and other angles. One finding across the world is that uh, places, geographies where there is se severe unrest going, hmm? suicide rates are less. Hmm? For example, during the Second World War or during wars, generally suicide rates fall. So in terms of Kerala, there are several explanations. But the, here huh. the paradox is, yeah. there is even a matrilineal system. Mm. It used to be a matriarchal system. Mm. There is no female feticide. There is no female infanticide. Mm. Female longevity is highest mm. in India. Mm. Female job opportunities highest in India. Female uh, position in society highest in India. You name any factor in the HDI, mm. Human Development Disease. Yeah. She is on top. Yeah. Yet this she who is on top, she is 34 per 10,000, in JNK is 2.2, .2, yeah. national average is 7 or Absolutely. 7 to 8. Mm -hmm. Which is a, yeah. has Even any, anyone done a study on this? No, no, again, see, you can only do studies as explanatory models. Hmm? And even given the, method, the um, measurement issues, you know, how good are measures for Chhattisgarh compared to Kerala and so on. Hmm? Even given for that, we know that there is a, there is, there is a high rate. Hmm? And that is a price that we pay for uh, social development. Hmm? So social, see the Kerala paradox is that exactly. Despite high level of human, there are various Kerala paradoxes. One is the original Kerala paradox, which is a state with uh, less economic development has higher human uh, development indices. Now the current Kerala paradox is, despite high human uh, HDI factors, why are indicators of mental health poor? Hmm? Drug and alcohol abuse, suicide rates, um, divorce rates are all on the rise. Hmm? So this points to a, you know, development does not make us automatically happy. Hmm? So the, that is why we have another index of the you know, happiness index where I believe Bhutan yeah. tops. Huh? So, so th these are two was, different aspects. Is there a proneness factor in some areas? V never mind whatever the development, is there a proneness? Yeah, yeah. The, the proneness is biological. Hmm? So and that is probably the same across cultures. Uh, if I have a, a family history of mental illness, I am more prone to develop not only mental illness, but commit suicide also. But then there are so many other factors. And the, the act of committing suicide is at that point uh, an impulsive act. Mm -hmm. People may plan for it and so on, but if they are thwarted in that 
at th that point of trying to kill themselves, they may not do it ever again. I've seen people who have been rescued from serious suicide attempts, uh, people who have jumped from bridges even and survived, hmm, who never gone, gone to do anything more because that, there is an impulsivity at that point. Once a death happens, it is all conjecture. Uh, whether it is deaths, farmers, uh, whether it is, uh, you know, quarrel with the husband the previous night, uh, whether it is being unemployed, it's all conjecture. Hmm? So we have models to try to explain suicides, but they remain models. Ultimately, it's a complex phenomenon with predominant social factors involved. That's my way of understanding and looking at it. Yeah, sure. Okay, uh, so back to what we do. Um, as you were asking, there are various levels of involvement uh, or training. So they may be, volunteers may be just involved with the local NGO and just help them in general. Or they may be actively associated with our clinical systems. Another group, you know, ever smaller group, will be associated with us in providing domiciliary care and aftercare. So they, they are playing direct clinical roles, care management roles running rehabilitation centers, running daycare centers, uh, and then go on to do more complex tasks such as providing psychosocial interventions or, uh, or um, psychotherapies. And it is from that group that we recruit people into MHAT. So gradually within MHAT, we want to get to a stage where there are larger numbers of non-professionals playing professional roles, trained and supervised by us, than actual professionals. We are so slowly getting there. Yeah, uh, so the whole concept of task sharing is that within MHAT, you know, medical professionals are few. So we task share with non-medical professionals. So as I speak to you, there are clinics running in uh, various places without a doctor. And today, because I'm here, they'll be contacting another doctor for support for decisions about medications and so on. But if my phone is on, I'll be advising them over phone or if, I, if possible, we are con increasingly moving on to a telemedical model, telemedicine model. In fact, I was here earlier in the morning discussing with a software company on developing that. At the moment, we use Skype increasingly effectively thanks to uh, Mukesh Ambani. It is now much more easier to do telepsychiatry. Um, so uh, as a med medical professional within MHAT, my role is uh, less of direct patient care and more of supervision. And that medical care that I relinquish is provided by non-medical professionals, not non-professionals. And as far as non-professional health workers are, uh, are in, can, involved, they are paid as our staff or they work with us as volunteers. And they task share with people above them, with uh, me, with the uh, non-medical professionals, and then they pass it on to levels below. So trained volunteer health workers running rehab services. We try to regularize training as much as possible. We run a number of certificate courses because we can't find any uh, university to associate with us. We do our own thing. We provide short term certificate courses mm -hmm. in trying to regularize all this training so that uh, you know, it's all manualized and uh, you, know, you can examine what we do and uh, others can follow if they wish. Yeah, so the, we run weekly clinics when I'm there, either in person or through Skype, uh, medical input is uh, either provided directly or increasingly remotely. Uh, the psychosocial interventions are increasingly provided by non-professional health workers. And this happens outside uh, MHAT and uh, in all aspects of community monitoring. So the roles of professionals becomes clinically diagnosis and planning management. That is, that is not compromised. So anybody new into the system, is gets to see a professional, uh, non-medical or, uh, or a medical person without a doctor seeing the diagnosis and management plan is not decided. So that process is often where the bottleneck is because it takes about an hour or more to, to understand a person's problems initially and to begin to chart a plan of action. So we don't compromise on that, so that takes time. And then a clinician will have direct management of complicated cases and indirectly over telephone and video, uh, clinical management and training, either basic or advanced, formal or informal, and with uh, regular as well as when needed support. So 
my phone is on all the time and people keep ringing me all the time that is okay nobody misuses that um, and i am able to intervene in emergencies or me or another doctor mm, or there are regular supervisory training mechanisms mm, increasingly manualized and uh, replicable so an important role of for professionals in all of this is setting standards mm. broadly we have Uh, what is called a recovery oriented philosophy because the focus is not on symptom relief but on helping people recover their lost capabilities and uh, part of it is deciding who you want to help and in our case it is the severely mentally ill uh, for whom we uh, decide that uh, they they should not be they should not have to pay there are controversies around that whether you should charge the token amount or you know get them to share the bills in some way but we believe that it should be totally free quality has to be defined in all aspects um diagnosis treatment uh, everything and deciding on how to do it so all of these are roles of the professionals okay. so we have 47 centers across five districts between 3 and 3 to 4000 patients of whom 70 to 80% are on continuing care more than 700 uh, volunteers work for us we also have moved on to have what we call an institute for community mental health which is where the research and teaching happens some of the courses are in association with the tata institute of social sciences uh, in social work and psychology and uh, of late we also have a, a center for psychotherapy so this is not decentralized but we have one place where people who require good psychological interventions provided by trained provided by professionals come to but that's only a small part of our service uh, so we have weekly outpatient clinics all the day care centers are situated within the clinics so uh, on the other days one of the uh, one or more of the other days these clinics also function as providing day care and the whole rehabilitation which is outside the centers which might include you know finding people jobs preparing their roofs sending children to school providing for clothes whatever mm-hmm. all aspects of rehabilitation are based on these clinics and the day care services I've already mentioned home based care several times and we organize uh, patients and families into support groups uh, and try to uh, empower them to uh, you know uh, look after themselves so it's decentralized increasingly deprofessionalized and uh, we would like to minimize the medical input and make it as be medicalized as, prof- as possible task sharing i've mentioned several times and obviously it's multi professionals um yeah we use technology electronic records telephony video conferencing and that is getting better and better as time goes by because connectivity is getting better but the crux is organizing volunteers to look after people in the community and rehabilitation which is based in the community so it could be as basic as this is just one of the i thought of from an earlier year you know earlier phase of our work one of the first clinics that we started so at the end of the clinic we all sit together and debrief and uh, people are given various tasks which are written down uh, and the next week reviewed all volunteers yeah we have uh, you know various short courses in community mental health rehabilitation counseling um, and so on and so forth uh, yeah and more such uh, courses are planned we have moved on to trying to do meaningful research uh, not research for research sake but things which would inform us in developing our services better of what happens to people over years uh, what is the quality of care it's very difficult to uh, you know get a grip on aspects of quality of care but we are trying to break it down and to see uh, you know what is quality and what is not and in the indian context modifying all this so it's not just us though even though i've talked about our work there are various organizations doing stellar work banyan in chennai or schizophrenia research foundation scarf in chennai are old organizations who do a lot of uh, innovative work ishwar sankalpa in um, in calcutta anjali in calcutta a lot of organizations over the last decade or two have come up and we are all kind of trying to uh, discover synergies and work together but it is all outside the medical or private system uh, and in various ways uh, involving the communities so really 
the whole point is that in a cost effective way civil societies communities can take over the roles which um, you know have traditionally been done by professionals um, vikram patel uh, one of the most influential um, psychiatrists and people is in the times 100 list uh, last year uh, said mental health care is too important to be left to professionals alone this is coming from a psychiatrist and it really hits the nail on the head it's so important it's so crucial to all our well being uh, but we pay the least attention and it's time we we took charge it's not enough to say that the government should do it or somebody else should do it but there is lots we can do ourselves and your peer counseling is probably a step in the right direction there's so much we can do uh, within ourselves with proper training and uh, and support uh and the the real issue is about sustainability and feasibility uh a lot of in ngo endeavors uh founder after um, after the initial grant runs out so we are trying to avoid that by having a broad base of financial support we get no funding from corporates or the government and we try to broad base it so that a lot of people contributing small bits of money is what keeps us going and of course we keep it cost down as well and we hope it will sustain because the ownership is with the local groups so if you were to start something here it will be your initiative we will be an external agency providing support that's the only way of sustaining it so even if we pull out you know we can be supp supplanted by somebody else so that is the whole model giving ownership to to groups to people so that it is sustainable and financial models which make it feasible and sustainable thank you
Any other questions? that she was referring to, even mental health has, uh, you have seen, you have been surprised by the cure. Yeah. Yes. Has the health of mental science reached a, a stage where, you know, the patient need not have, I am referring to illnesses like schizophrenia, bipolar, where the person can switch to yoga or other such non-medicinal, you know, uh, has it reached that point or they all need medicines? Because of our uh, you know, limitations, we have chosen to focus on the severest illnesses. They would be paid with required medications, plus other initiatives. As you move down the severe, say less severe, that balance is going to change. You will probably need less medication, more psychotherapy or counseling. And as you go down further, you may not require any medications either. But uh, attention to the way we live. Uh, I would never see yoga or meditation or anything as how you would see patterns as to be taken in isolation. It's part of the whole life strategy. So doing yoga alone without changing anything else in our lives, everything really works. So it's for the less severe problems, it's about changing the ways we live. Uh, for the most severe, the role of medications and more, uh, more specialist kind of interventions, the role in this. Okay, uh, on that note, I just have to uh, close the session. Uh, so thank you very much. There is a lot of interest and there is a lot of uh, there are a lot of questions that each of us have. So I think this is this been one of those sessions which have traversed an entire age from trying to debunk some of the myths around uh, surrounding mental health and mental illness, and also to talk about uh, and locating the model of intervention. And I think it's 
what's fascinating and what's always been inspiring for me is the fact that we talk the voluntary sector very often just as a terminology without having any volunteers in it. Uh, and I think uh, it has really uh, in some ways proved that it's, there are volunteers and there is the spirit of volunteerism is still possible to significantly transform people's lives. And I think reaching 400 people, 4,000 people and 700 care, caregivers through that process I think is just fascinating. Uh, and I'm sure that each of us has something to take away from this in terms of our own ways of working and our own ways of approaching our lives. So thank you very much and hopefully we will keep in touch and there are many courses that I think we and also, I need not be here physically. Delhi has media parking is so advanced. But sometimes I teach students in Amsterdam, really segment and do media. So we could be proud of it. There's a small group, you know, just do it, just form. We could have regular interactions. You deserve it. That's fantastic. One quick announcement, uh, the open house of the Anurag is happening in the cafeteria so people are interested in that can go down um, to the open house. Okay. Yeah.